word we're going to focus on today is the word resolution. And a couple things just to kind of give you some background and to kind of prepare you for some things that are going to happen today. Uh, one of them is I am leaning heavily on a hymn. I don't know if you grew up in a Baptist church and the Baptist hymnal was, was what you used in that Baptist church. I can remember using the 1955 Blue Baptist hymnal. That's, that was just a few years. As the year I was born, you know, right after that, our, the Baptist hymnal was what we used in our church. But there were some songs that we sang over and over and over and over again. And at our church, the, the music director would get up and say, y'all turn to page number Whatever the page number was, we're going to sing the first, second, and last stanzas of this song. I don't know why we never sang the third stanzas, but the third stanzas usually had something to say, and we just glossed right over it. Because a lot of times, it wasn't, what the wor- it wasn't the words that were important to us, it was just making it through a song. We're going to sing the first, second, and last. If you sing just the first, second, and last stanza of Amazing Grace, you miss some of the best parts. You miss the, you miss the heart. Of- it would be like saying to us, Y'all turn to John chapter 3, we're going to read verses 14, 15, then we're going to skip down to verse 17 and leave out totally John 3, 16. You understand what I'm saying? The heart of the message sometimes. And there were songs that we became so familiar with that I can, I can to this day remember the page numbers uh, as they did that. And as I was preparing this sermon, I kept going back to page number 216. Page number 216 in the Baptist Hymnal, 1955 version. It's it's page number 301 in the 1975 version of the Baptist Hymnal. And I'm sure that it's in any Baptist Hymnal that's been printed since then. But it's a song that simply says, I am resolved. You may may recognize it, but I'm going to be leaning heavily on that hymn today. It was written by a man named Palmer Hartso, uh, who was a traveling lyricist. He went from place to place and offered his ability to put lyrics to music. He, he, he connected with James Fillmore, who wrote the music to the, to the, wrote the tune to this song, and later on, Palmer Hartzong put the words, I am resolved, to this particular song. It was written in the late 1800s, and to this day still speaks extremely well to where I want to go this morning. The other thing that I want to say to you, particularly those of you that are online, there will be a voice heard other than mine during this sermon, that will be my wife. Uh, Jan and I are going to tandem this sermon this morning. She's going she's to preach part of it, and I'm going to preach part of it. And so you'll hear that voice, and those of you that may not be able to see it online will at least know that that's Jan, my wife, that's going to be helping me with this sermon. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, if you would, and we want to uh, look down verses 11 through, through the verse that we're going to today. Uh, hopefully you've got these words down, self-will, selfishness separation, all of that, and I'm going to remind you of those in just a moment, but we've come to realization. We got to the place where starvation is not where we wanted to be, and the young boy realized that back home he had all the resources that he needed, and he came to his senses is what the text says, and the very next thing is resolution. He said, I will go. The I will go is I've made a decision to do something to change where I am. Realization is not enough. To realize that you got a father who loves you is not enough. To realize that God sent his son to die on a cross that you might have salvation is not enough. Realizing that uh, or coming to the realization that God is something that's absent from your life and you need to have him present in your life is not enough. I want to drive home the fact that realization is not the awakening. Realization is the beginning of the process. Until you decide, I will and do whatever it is that you say I will, you're not going to make it back to the Father. There's a part that we have to do. God sent his son, but we have to go to the cross. God sent his son, but we have to be covered by his blood. God sent his son, but we have to to respond to the invitation to God's grace. Let's read the story down to where we are today, and then we're going to look at resolution. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth among them. And, di- and, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. 
and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I will get up and go. That's resolution. I had the privilege in South Carolina to serve on the resolutions committee for our state convention one year. The resolutions committee is the committee that takes all of everyone's recommendations for a resolution. They massage them. They rework them. They decide whether they're going to present them to the convention for approval or not. But a lot of times a resolution was a statement against something or a statement in favor of something. And a resolution has a very simple pattern to it. It usually begins with whereas. And you may have three or four whereases in that resolution. Whereas, let me give you an example of one that we passed every year, no matter what town we were in. Whereas the city of Columbia is a wonderful place to hold our convention, and whereas the residents of uh, of, of Columbia have been hospitable and so nice to let us gather here, and whereas the, the mayor of that city, blah, 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 be it resolved that we say thank you from the very depths of our heart. And, and there may be several resolutions that went with that. There are whereases that set up what you're resolved to do. I want to read you the part of a resolution today, and then I want to preach to you the end of that resolution. Whereas I have exercised my self-will and have allowed selfishness to take more control of my life and... Whereas I have separated myself from the Father and have chosen to live sensually, and whereas this has led to self-destitution and self-abasement, and whereas I have come to the point of spiritual starvation in my life, be it therefore resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Have you heard that hymn before? Be it therefore resolved, I am no longer going to linger. I'm no longer to be charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher and things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. You see, come to realization that you're spiritually starved turns you around and it gives you a new set of priorities in your life. Certain things become more important to you. I will leave the lure of the world. I will leave the things that have brought me to starvation. You see, that's, that's the most difficult part of resolution. Resolution is I've got to make a choice of what I'm going to leave behind and where I'm going to go. Resolution means there has to be a different set of priorities in my life. I'm going to, fun, I'm going to come to the one that is higher and nobler and, and the one that, has, that, that this has allured my sight. This has now got my attention. There's a realization in most of our lives when we, when we come to the cross, whatever happens in our lives, someone preaches a sermon, someone sings a song, somebody does a slideshow, somebody takes us to the Holy Land, whatever it may happen is, but we come face to face with a realization of a cross. I've often heard that the cross is the crossroads of our spiritual lives, that once we're made aware of what Jesus Christ did for us, We have one of two decisions that need to be made. We're either going to follow in the way of the cross or we're going to reject it. It's pretty simple. It doesn't get any simpler than that. There's not a whole lot of compromise. There's not a whole lot of negotiation. There's this this ideology that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. He gave himself for us. And then the question is, now what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm just going to turn around and go back home. I appreciate the message. I appreciate the cross. Thanks for doing that for me. But I'm really not allured by you. I'm not drawn by that. Do you remember the passage when Jesus was talking to, uh, and Jesus may have been talking to Nicodemus when he made this statement. He said, you remember that day in in, in Moses' day when the people were being bitten by the serpents? 
And, and God said to Moses, create a brazen image of a snake and lift it up in the middle of the camp. And those who look up to the, to the brazen image will be saved from that. What a wonderful story. But in what context was Jesus telling that to Nicodemus? There will be a day, Nicodemus, when I will be lifted up. And when I am lifted up, all men will see. And all of those who follow will be redeemed and saved. I, I come because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When people look to the cross and do nothing, salvation has not been completed. There has to be that point where we say, I am drawn by the one who has been lifted up. Do you know there were some people in the wilderness that died because they just were stubborn enough not to look up at that brazen image? I want you to hear something. Listen to this for a moment. Let's just pretend that all of us are in the wilderness. And me and Evan and Jim and Courtney and Chris Spencer all got bit by a snake. Now I tell you what, I ain't going to get bit by no snake because I'm not going to get near no snake. If I got bit by a mistake, if I got bit by a snake, it was by surprise and mistake. I don't like snakes. But all of us got bit by a snake, and we know that that snake is poisonous. And so Brother Moses comes out and says, hey, y'all, just been talking to God. God told me to build this, build this brazen image, and I'm going to lift it up, and all you have to do is look up at it, and you'll be okay. Evan's a true believer. He jumps up there, and he looks up real quick, jumps up, walks off. He's fine. And all the rest of us are watching Evan walk off and say, boy, he looks, looks like a snake didn't bother him at all. Jim says, I like that. He looks up at the snake. Now, Chris and Courtney are stubborn. And both of them said, I know what the law teaches. The teaches that we're to have no brazen images before God. And we ain't going to look up at that snake no matter what God said Moses to do. Now you got Evan up walking around, you got Jim up walking around, and I tell you right off the bat, if I get bit by a snake, I'll do anything I can. So I've looked up at that, and we're all walking around, and we're dancing and singing and having a good time, and Chris and Courtney continue to die because they will not look up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll do what? I'll draw you to me. We have to make a choice to take the steps towards that. Be it further resolved I am resolved to go to the Savior leaving my sin and try He is the true just one he hath the words of life i am resolved to follow the savior you see there's more to that than just taking the first steps there's more to it than just becoming realized that i need a savior looking up to the cross and saying well there's the answer but then there is that step of faith that i must take i must follow the savior who is faithful and true every day I will listen to what he says to me. I will do what he wills for my life. He is the living way. He is the word that I must incorporate into my life. Part of, part of this resolution is I am going to change the way that I live. Now, we've often heard this on, on many occasions. And I want to make sure you understand that that's not what I'm talking about. We have to talk about people who live these real terrible, sinful lives on the surface and what they need to do to be saved, just stop doing all that stuff. It's far deeper than that. It involves people who have been spiritually starved because they're selfish, are greedy. It's because people have taken steps away from the Father. Whatever it is that draws us back to the Father, there must be a resolution in my life that I'm going to do what he says and I'm going to do what he wills for my life. Sometimes we think that Jesus is only there to make life miserable for us. He wants to take away all the fun stuff and leave us miserable. That's not what this is about. This is the Savior who says to me, if you'll follow me, I will give you life. 
If you follow me, I'll give you living water. If you follow me, I will come alive in you. The word will become real inside of you and you will understand. Sometimes when we're spiritually deprived and sometimes when we're to the point of starvation, we forget that those little bits from the word that survive for us and help us to serve, they sustain us and move us forward. I'm going to listen to Jesus. I'm going to follow where he leads me. It's no longer am I going to follow my blind ambition. It's no longer me following my selfishness. It's no longer me doing what I think is best for me. I am going to follow the one who will speak to me, and I'm going to follow the one who's going to give the words of life to me. I'm going to leave my sin and strife behind. He's the true one. He's the just one. He provides for me the words that I need. Be it further resolved, I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. How many of you can testify today that God has led you wrongly? No, no witnesses, no testimony? Is there anybody here today that will say that when you followed Jesus, that he led you in the wrong direction? Nobody? I can't get a witness this morning? The reality of that is just so foreign, isn't it? That God or Christ would lead me counterproductive to my life. If I believe that God has the best interest for me, if I believe that God loves me, let's start right there. If I believe that God loves me, and I believe that God wants me to be in his presence, and he wants me to be in his family, why would he ever lead me somewhere that's going to cause me harm? Now, that may not necessarily mean that I won't suffer along the journey. But he walks with me every step of the way. And every step of the way, I have to come to the conclusion that I may be hurting, I may be suffering, I may be going through a difficult time in my life, but he has not left me. He has not led me away from, from his salvation. He has not led me away. If I follow him, I will get to the other side. Peter steps out of a boat because Jesus said, go ahead, Peter, step out of the boat. Now, you have to think for a few moments that Peter said, now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Do you think that Peter, just for a moment, stood back in that boat and said, now, I believe that you're the Savior. I have watched you perform miracles. I, have, I, I believe who you are, but I'm just not sure you're leading me the right way right now. Peter, it's my words. Peter, it's my will. Peter, it's what I compel you to do. How many times have we, in our resolution to go back home, have forgotten that the words that he speaks are good for us? He's the true one. He's the just one. He's the one that, that will lead us through the difficult times of life and will always take us to the place where we need to be. It may not be the most comfortable all the time, but life is never all that comfortable. What would a man give up? What would a man, why would a man hold on to everything and lose his own soul? Why would a man be so proud and so, so prideful that he would be willing to starve to death spiritually before he would ever listen to the wise one? Some of you are parents and you think that you're wise. I thought I was too. We tried to give advice to our children and, and sometimes the advice we gave was good advice and sometimes the advice that we gave turned out being not so good. It's just because we're not perfect. It's because we struggle through life. But when Jesus calls us and Jesus says, follow me, where we walk is going to be important. There's a scene from the movie, The Chosen, that I've been giving you scenes of as, I, as they impact the sermon. 
but there's one where they're trying to decide which direction are they going to go. Jesus and all the disciples are together. Jesus says, we're going to go through Samaria. And all of them stop and say, Jesus, we don't go through Samaria. Those people in Samaria don't like us. We're Jews. Jews don't like Samaritans. Samaritans don't like us. Uh, is there a reason why we're going to Samaria? And, and, and even one of them's got a map and says, all we have to do is go around this way. We can go this way. We can avoid Samaria. And they're giving all the rationale. And Jesus turns and says to them, this is going to be a long journey if we have to have a question and answer every time I speak. Do you hear that? This is going to be a difficult journey if you're going to question everything that I say. There's a point where you have to trust me and just simply go where I go. Why? Because I'm not going to make a mistake. I'm not going to lead us where we shouldn't be. I'm going to put us at the very spot that God wants us because I am hearing his voice and I'm going where he tells me to go. I'm going to be where he wants me to be and you can follow or you can stay, but I must go through Samaria. There are times when we stop and we say to Jesus, are you sure we got to go through there? Are you sure we got to go there? You don't understand, Jesus. How many times have you said to God, you don't understand? How many times in your spiritual life have you said, well, that the, that's not the wisest decision, I'm sure. It's time to put our pride behind and simply trust the one who says, follow me. Be it further resolved. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. When does one enter the kingdom? We enter the kingdom when we realize that where we are is not where we want to be, and we take that first step. We take the answer to God. I want to enter the kingdom. Be it therefore resolved. I am going to take the first step. I'm going to enter the kingdom. And when I enter the kingdom, I'm going to leave my sin behind. Now, we all know that we don't stop sinning when we become a part of the kingdom. Because every one of us is sitting there thinking, well, I entered the kingdom. I did pretty good for the first 24 hours. I did pretty good for the first hour. <laughs> I did pretty, but then, man, it just caught up with me. Let me tell you what happens. When I enter the kingdom... I come under the protection of the blood of Christ. When, I, when I'm out here outside the kingdom, I am exposed to God with all of my sin. When God sees me, he sees me as a sinner who needs redemption, but he's waiting to take the first step. And he says, if you take the first step into the kingdom, what happens is the blood of Christ covers you, and I no longer see your sin. Now, there's some folks that will argue with that because they like to hold on to this idea that we can live perfect and therefore we should be sinless in our lives. Let me tell you something. The reason that this young man is going back home is because he knows at home he can live a better life than where he is. He's not perfect. He's not going to be perfect. But he knows that if he gets back home, at least he'll be able to eat. There's a part of me that says, I can't leave my sinfulness. I leave the nature of my sinfulness behind as best I can. I understand that once I come under the blood of Christ, I have been redeemed. God no longer sees my sin, but every time that I do wrong, it affects me and the people around me. And that's not what I desire anymore. My friends may oppose me. There may be those who resist me. There will be those that will tell me I'm making a wrong choice by going back home. There will be those that say, don't walk in that Christian way. They're a bunch of hypocrites. I want to make a statement this morning. I believe that the, that the church is filled with hypocrites. And there's room for one more. We're all hypocrites. We all proclaim one thing and do something else. When I enter the kingdom, the blood of Christ covers me. He no longer sees me as sinful. I may live in rebellion even while I'm in the kingdom. But it hurts me. It hurts others. And Jesus says, if you really want to understand what it is, let the blood cover you. Before me, I no longer see your sin. What I need for you to do is to understand that you've got to stop hurting other people. 
That's going to be a sermon we're going to hear down the road. Be it therefore and finally resolved. I am resolved and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. And there's something about walking this journey alone. I am resolved to go to the kingdom. I am resolved to go to the Father. I am resolved to go in that direction. But there's a part of me that says, y'all come with me. You hear that? There's a, there's a part of it that says, I'm heading towards what I think is good. And I want to invite anybody else that's in the pig pen to come with me. I wonder if this young man turned to a bunch of pigs and said, hey, you want to go home? Because it sounds like he's the only one in the pig pen. But on that journey back home, did he find anybody else that was hurting? Did he see anybody else that was struggling? You know, part of the resolution of my, my life is that I no longer just see me. Remember, selfishness was at the very beginning of this. When I go back home, I should no longer be selfish. I should be willing to share with everybody that I meet along the journey. As I make my way back home, I'm going to find some other folks that are in the pig pen. And I'm going to invite them to join with me. Why? Because I've come to the realization that starving in the pig pen is not the place to be. And I know that back home there's plenty to eat. My mother never did like me very much at supper time sometimes because I'd invite my friends to come to my house to eat. My grandmother, who's husband was the pastor of the church that I attended, every meal that she made made more than enough for her, her family, and anybody that we invited to the family. On Wednesday night, I could invite all of my friends to go to my grandmother's house, and I would guarantee that there would be enough for everyone to eat. She might would have to put a little extra water in the pot. But there was plenty enough to eat. I'm wondering sometimes in the Christian faith how many of us have become so self-centered in our own faith that we have forgotten the invitation to others. We have forgotten to go along and as we're making our way, be it therefore resolved, I will take anybody that's willing to go with me. I will invite everybody as I go. Where are you going, Steve? I'm going to the Father. You want to go too? Come join me. What have you resolved to do? I've resolved to go back home. i got plenty enough to eat there. If you're hungry, come with me. Jesus once said, if you're hungry, come unto me. If you're thirsty, come unto me. He says to his disciples, go out there and feed the hungry. Go out there and give a cup of water to the thirsty. Invite anybody that you can to be a part of the kingdom. It's not an isolated event. It's an event that we live in relationship with each other. I am resolved to do some things today in my life. I am resolved to no longer linger in this world in which I live. I am resolved to go to the Savior. I am resolved to follow that Savior. I am resolved to enter the kingdom that he's invited me to be a part of. And I am resolved that I'm going to take as many people with me as I go. That's what resolution is. Resolution says, this young man said, I have, there are hired servants in my father's house that are eating better than I am, I will go home. Until we take the state, until we take the step of saying, I will go home, we stay in the pig pen. We, know, we may know that God loves us. We may know that Jesus died on a cross for us. We may know that we were even part of a church one day. But until we take that first step back home, we haven't resolved anything. I would say to you today, therefore be it resolved, and then you fill in the blank. That hymn captured it for me. It's all the things that I know that I need to do in order to go back to the Father. Dear Father, remind us today that we need to be resolved about some things. There's some resolution that must be done on our part. 
We just can't realize and not take a step. We just can't come to our senses and not say, I will go back home. There is some responsibility on our part. I will go. I will follow. I will enter the kingdom, and I will invite others to be a part of that. That's become the the essence of what it means for me to the journey back home. We pray that others might find some resolution in their lives of what they need in order to head back to the Father. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake.